Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hospitality Edge podcast. This podcast is meant to bring together what we think are two sides of the same coin, real estate and hospitality. Whether you are a current or aspiring short-term rental property manager, host, or real estate investor, you're in the right place. Dive in with us to uncover the captivating stories and golden nuggets from industry heavyweights, including leaders, operators, investors, syndicators, founders, and entrepreneurs. So thank you. Really, thank you for embarking on this journey with me. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this podcast, and I promise I'll do my best to deliver value-packed episodes that hopefully will not just inform, but also help inspire the next generation of real estate and hospitality professionals. Truly yours, Sebastián Muñoz. All right. Hello and welcome everyone to the Hospitality Edge podcast, where we bring together what we think are two sides of the same coin, real estate and hospitality. And today I'm super excited to have a very special guest with us. Uh, so we have Michael Fredman, the one and only. So, you know, more than 35 years of experience in the luxury hospitality, vacation rental, online travel, real estate space, founder of, you know, Vacation Rental University, has been on the vendor side, on the PMS side, on the luxury hospitality side of things, work, you know, has worked with franchises and has been named one of the top 20 most influential professionals in the vacation rental industry globally by Luxury Hospitality. So without further ado, Michael, welcome to the show and thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. It's it's great to be here and I appreciate uh, you having me on. I look forward to chatting further. Yeah, absolutely. So just for anyone out there that, uh, you know, uh, hasn't heard of you or doesn't know uh, the, the entire story, you, you got into this vacation rental space, um, you know, with the franchising model with iTrips. Is that correct? Yeah, so I I had been in the real estate industry for oh gosh about fifteen years, and prior to venturing into vacation rentals, and um, I had started um, a consulting project actually with iTrip. Uh, they were looking for someone to head up and uh, develop their training and business development for their franchise owners. Uh, that they were bringing on new destinations, leisure destinations uh, throughout North America. And uh, it started really as a consulting project that turned into a full-time opportunity, uh, which now has led me to to where I am today. Um, you know, and obviously being in the industry, um, have done, you know, similar things, but also worked on, like you alluded to, um, various different things within the industry and in the space. Uh, over over the last you know fifteen years or plus, and um, it's been great. It, it's it's uh, I I love this industry. I I love what's happening in this industry, and I'm sure we can talk more about it. But I think one of the things that's been really important to me is that I've had the chance to work in just various verticals within the short term hospitality space, like you you did say you know property management, the vendor side, PMS. Um, some insurance consulting, and then also um, most recently we're being involved in the last couple of years on the luxury side with the Villa Chalet product as well. So yeah. it's been it's been great. That's awesome, Michael. And and so I want to I want to touch on on the franchise model for a second, just sure. for for everyone out there. You know, we we we've uh, had a lot of you know traditional operators on the show. We've had you know arbitrage operators on the show as well. So you know those are different options that you have. You know, you can you can manage other people's properties, you can rent mm -hmm. and sublease, you can invest and buy your own. But talk to us a little bit about what's unique from your point of view about the the franchise model, just since that's how you got started in in this vacation rental space. And how has that franchise model evolved? Like where where are we at right now in terms of the landscape of fr franchise options that exist in the space? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I started, there were, weren't really a lot of uh, franchise models um, that were available for individuals who wanted to venture and get into the, the, the world of property management for short-term vacation rentals. Um, iTrip at the time was really it. Um, there were a couple others, but nothing. No one was ever really wasn't really making any headway. And um, I think what what we've seen, you know, is an expansion of that. 
Uh, what franchising I think does is it allows individuals who are interested in getting into this business, um, which is not that difficult, but yet there are a lot of, uh, I don't want to say barriers, but there are a lot of things that a person has to do to be successful in this business. And we can talk more about that. But I think what franchising does and being, and being involved in the franchise model is it gives you a proven system. It gives you a proven system that um, you can kind of plug and play. Yes, there's a cost associated with it. And, you know, there's upfront costs, there's ongoing royalties and things like that. But I think what most of the franchising companies have done today, iTrip, Casago, Brand Welcome, um, you know, all of the uh, Skyrun where I was at for a couple of years, they've all, they've all built really, really good business models and, they, and it allows those individuals to be successful fairly quickly. Versus, because there is a learning curve, as you know, you know, and I think that's one of the things when we built Vacation Rental University, myself, Mike Bird, Jim Bull, and a couple other people built Vacation Rental University was there was a gap, there was a void in education in this industry. And we felt, you know, with Vacation Rental University, we could solve some of those challenges. And we did. We can talk more about that. But I think what, what franchising has been able to do is to allow someone to, you know, build success quicker, sooner rather than later, you know, instead of taking time and, you know, that it takes to, you know, set up a company, source a PMS, what are the third party tools, I need, you know, pricing tools, all of those types of things. How do I then go out and find homeowners? Now I've got homeowners. What's the operations side of my business look like? Franchising is all that figured out. And I think, you know, all those companies I mentioned are really good companies and they do a really good job of helping the individual um, get to a success level much quicker than if it was a person was to do it on their own. Absolutely. And and I want to cover so many more things, but just on this franchise model first. So if you are an existing property management company, you have your brand, you're familiar with you know the tools that are out there, probably franchising is not as appealing. Correct me if I'm wrong. So you're, you're mostly selling franchises to people that perhaps are new in the space that maybe are serial entrepreneurs. They have another business. They, they just want something that's turnkey. Is that correct? Is that is that who you're going after yeah. when, when selling franchises mainly? Because there's yeah. the brand component too that, you know, if you're already operating, do you want to give away that brand? And, and do you want to put someone else's brand on top of it. Did you did you face that as a challenge? And, and who is it that you were targeting uh, when, when you were selling franchises? Yeah, good question. Um, I think there's two two parts to that answer. The first part is, is that most of the people we would engage who wanted to come on board to a franchise brand were like you described. They're an entrepreneur. They've got other businesses. They wanted to get into this industry. They didn't really have a management company. Now, we did encounter some smaller companies that were interested in, you know, maybe they had 10, 15, 20, 30 properties. They really had not established a brand yet in their local market or destination. And they wanted to maybe align with the brand because they felt it would give them quicker growth. It would give them better systems, operational levels of excellence that they might not be achieving. So it really just depended upon uh, those types of individuals. I'd say for the most part, though, um, it was people who were interested in getting into this industry and had never been in it before. Um, but I would say, you know, you talk about the brand. I think it's that's and that's we could spend hours just talking about branding in the vacation rental space because it's it's not as easy as a lot of people think. And I think when people do align with the brand, you know, they're, they're looking for that, you know, national exposure to say, well, I'm, I'm here in, you know, Miami, Florida, but we also have, you know, a, a brand uh, in Seattle, Washington, and, you know, in Breckenridge, Colorado, and so on and so forth. So it gives them a little bit more credibility too, I believe as well, um, aligning with uh, a franchise, franchise business model. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think the brand is is huge. And, and you know, again, going back to the different models that exist, you know, property management, quite straightforward. You charge a fee and you're going to manage everything for the owner, reservations and cleaning, maintenance, everything else. Arbitrage, you rent and you sublease. You, 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 you take the risk, but you take the upside as well. Uh, 
Now, when it comes to franchise, would you say, you know, in terms of the value proposition there, of course, there's the tech stack that some of it you might have developed in-house, some of it might be third-party vendors, whatnot. There's the brand, which we discussed briefly. But then, you know, you actually built an educational program on the back end for your destination um, managers, uh, owners, uh, for everything they need to actually be successful in terms of running the business. So how much of the value proposition was that educational program that you built on the back end? And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what were some of those things that you were teaching your destination owners for them to be successful at, at, at running the, their operation? Yeah, that's a great, great point. I, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges, people ask me this question all the time when they get into the business is like, what's the biggest challenge um, that people face as far as becoming successful in this industry? And I, and I think the biggest challenge, and, and I'm not going to, this wasn't uh, true for just one specific company. This is true for, for any property management company or any franchise business model. It's going from zero homes under management to 30 or 40 really quickly. Because ultimately at the end of the day, if you don't have properties to manage, you don't have a business. And so I think the things that we recognized, I recognized at iTrip, I recognized at Skyrun, I've recognized just being in the industry. And part of, you know, one of the reasons why we created Vacation Rental University too was, was that um, education is just lacking. And so if I'm going into this business brand new without any background in real estate, property management, sales, whatever the case would be, and I want to be successful at this, I need to, I need to understand the industry. Um, so one of the things we did was, you know, with, with both of the business models that I worked with is to create a platform, not just to learn the technical aspects of things, because the, the tech stack, like you described, the PMS, the third-party tools, the software, you know, built around cleaning and maintenance and pricing. Those are all great tools. And there's great companies that are doing those things that we used to integrate with, with our system. But then it's the day-to-day. -day. It's like, okay, I got this business now. Now what do I do? And it really starts with them understanding and educating them on how to go out and acquire homeowners, find homeowners that want to put their homes in that program. And uh, so we built modules around that um, as it related to really key focusing in on that was one of the main core items uh, that these individuals needed to learn right out of the gate, whether it's developing relationships with the local realtor community and building a realtor referral program, getting involved in networking groups, doing direct mail. Um, th there's, there's, there's probably eight or 10 or 12 different things that a person should be doing at any one given time. And it was really showing them how to how to do that because at the end of the day, like I'll go back to what I said, um, if unless they were in that community and they were really really ensconced in, you know, having a great deep network, which we hope they have in that in the local market and they know people, but they're not going to get a lot of referrals right out of the gate. Uh, so so you have to go out and you have to find those homeowners that are with competitors. You know that are unhappy with those. You know, maybe someone who's managing their home currently, maybe excuse me, they're doing it on their own and they're just challenged by it. So, finding those homeowners was was really the first and most important part of the piece of the puzzle to become successful in this business for any of those owners. That is very interesting, and and there's there's two I would say schools of thought out there when it comes to this, and I'd love to get your opinion here. Basically. You know, when it comes to doing everything yourself versus outsourcing and focusing on growth, right? So on one end, you have, you know, I need to learn every single tool. I need to be the one, you know, that understands every every piece of the equation so that if I have owner questions or whatnot, I can address them. And yes, absolutely, there's some value, you know, to that. And you've even mentioned in other podcasts that you recommend being involved up to a certain point, maybe five, 10 properties on their management. But then it gets to a point where you talk about leverage a lot. And I, I love, you know, what the concept of leverage means, which is essentially more output for the same amount of input, right? And you 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 are actually on, on that other side of, of the equation, suggesting property managers to 
delegate as much as they can on the revenue management side of things, maybe on the day-to-day, -day, you know, guest communication side of things, listing optimization, whatnot. And, and you're actually recommending that what they should be spending most of their time on, to your previous point, is, you know, homeowner acquisition and expansion. What do you think people don't get or what do you think is the mistake that people uh, make when it comes to where they decide to allocate most of their time in their business? Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. So my, my philosophy might be different than a lot of people who are going to listen to this and what they're going to hear and think. It, you, you hit on it, though. You know, I'm all about leverage. Um, I think today in our industry, the the industry has built great, you know, PMS systems. Uh, there's companies out there that have been built great, you know, tools, revenue management tools, pricing tools, cleaning management tools, operational tools, guest experience tools. It's all there, you know. And so when you start this business, you know, you're you're going to need to know how those 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 systems and solutions work. But that doesn't mean you have to do them. I'm one of those believers that even from day one, when a person starts this business, one of the first things they should do is they should outsource their reservations. They might not even have any properties, but there are companies out there today who all their focus is it's just doing reservations and reviews for property management companies. And I'd be hiring those individuals because first and foremost, um, doing reservations takes a lot of work and a lot of time. Do I need to know how to do those things? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I'll go back to what I said earlier, is that if I don't have homes in my portfolio to manage, all of the other stuff is completely irrelevant. You can have the best mousetrap, but if that mousetrap isn't catching something, it's not going to be, there's nothing there. And so I, I think learning how to leverage properly is really important. It's challenging because people don't want to spend that money up front. They think they don't need it. They need to learn how to do everything. And I get that to a point. But I think at some point, if you're really serious about this industry and you're not just playing it, like if I'm just in this and I'm going to manage 10 from my friend's homes, you know, then, then that's different. But if I'm a serious professional property manager, and I think a lot of people who will listen to this and hear this are, then then you have to be focused on leveraging growth. And and now the good part of our industry are there tools today that can help you identify personality profiles and things like that, who, you know, when you do hire, you're hiring the right personality profile uh, for an operational role because their personality might be different than someone for growth. So my point in all of it is, is that Yes, you have to know what's going on in your business, but I'm a believer that we should leverage as much as we can as soon as we can. Um, and it just it just makes sense. I mean, because at the end of the day, um, talking to homeowners, signing that lease or that contract agreement for them to come on for you to manage their home is really what this is all about, and that's where it starts. Now, don't I'm not saying that all the other pieces are not important. They absolutely are. Um, but I think until you have that and you can scale and, um, you know, you've got 30, 40, 50, 60 homes, um, you, you have to do some of it on your own, but it's also okay to say, no, I'm going to hire someone to do that for me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big believer of, of what you're saying as well. And uh, it, it's kind of what I tell property managers on a daily basis, right? Because it's kind of what we do at Angel Host. We, we are a, a company that helps property managers with the reservations, precisely like you were mentioning. And so it's basically like focus on the areas where your time is going to have the highest impact. And it is not replying to guests. And even though you might enjoy math and, and you might enjoy, you know, ro you know, building your own competitive set and, you know, doing your own market analysis, that's, that's, you know, an entire day that you spend doing that is an entire day you didn't spend growing your business. Well, it's, it's true. And I think some people don't like to do the things, you know, and let me rephrase this. That's not the right way. Um, I think sometimes people like to do things that they think they're being busy at and it's important and valuable to the business because they're maybe scared to do some of those other things. 
So I would say to someone who's listening to this, if your strength is not, you know, prospecting and growing and building your business, but you're more operationally driven, then you need to find someone immediately who can go out and do that for you because you're never going to be able to scale and grow the way you want. But on the flip side, I want to go back to something you just said, and that's that's what's your time value per hour? You know, I, I've got to a stage in my career where I do not do anything, whether it's a consulting project or anything else, as it relates to my role in a company. If it's if it's under five hundred dollars an hour, I don't do it. I find someone else to do it because I know my value at five hundred dollars an hour is probably even higher now, but but at $500 an hour, um, that's where I'm giving someone the best and greatest return. And so if I have to hire someone or leverage someone, I mean, I just did that recently for a project I'm doing in a consulting relationship where I need an article written about something. I'm hiring someone to write an article that would take me hours to do within a couple days, and it's going to cost me 300 bucks. It makes, it makes perfect sense to do that. And I think someone as, as seasoned and with as much experience as you, you know, has that mentality, but sometimes it's, it's hard to have that same mentality when you're, when you're starting out or when you're growing, but it's so fundamental, I think for, for success. And, and, you know, it comes down to, it comes down to what you were saying, you know, how much is my time worth and is this the best use of my time? And, and, you know, it's, it's the mentality of an entrepreneur versus uh, someone that's just replacing their income from their job with, you know, a business, but in reality, all they're doing is they're creating another job for themselves, right? It's exactly. it's going from the uh, what to the who. That's another way to put it. Like what needs to be done is is when you're thinking in terms of, you know, I'm a solopreneur, I'm going to do everything myself. That's the what mentality. But then there's the who mentality of, growing a business hey let's let's put the people in place to accelerate our growth and and let's focus on the vision and as you said it comes down to also self-awareness are you more of a growth person or are you more of a you know operations person and both are fine you just need to know what you're good at and focus your time and your energy there and outsource the rest yeah i mean when i was selling real estate i had a business coach and i and i still work with coaches to this day because i believe in that um, is I, I focused on what I call my DIPA, direct income producing activities. And there mm-hmm. were only two things, two things. There was prospecting, going on appointments, and, and signing contracts when I was selling real estate. Those mm-hmm. are the only two things I did. I prospected, I wanted listing appointments, and signed contracts. Those were the two things that if I did those two things every single day, everything else in my business took care of itself. Mm. So, where I'm going with it is that there's indirect income producing activities and then there's production supporting activities. Now that's real estate mindset here, but it also equates to our vacation rental industry is that we have a set of direct income producing activities and we should be focused on those. We have a, a, a set of production, excuse me, indirect income producing activities where we should be focused on those to some degree, but 80% of our time should be spent in that first direct income producing then maybe 10% and 10% or even less than that in production supporting. Those are the things like, I'm not doing this, I'm delegating it, I'm hiring, I'm paying someone else to do it for me. Mm-hmm. Because if I took that hour and put it to prospecting, what if I added three more homes? So that's the mentality that you know one has to have. Yes, it's hard in the beginning, but if you establish it from the beginning and that's how you start your thinking, you're going to be that much more successful that quick. And I'm so excited about this conversation. Now, talking about mentality, you you also have a series uh, on Amazon Talk uh, that that that's called you know stop bitching, start you know exercising or or prospecting or whatnot. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think it also comes from your coaching background, no? It it does actually, and it's interesting you bring that up. It's a it's a series that I started uh, that I never honestly I'll be be completely candid never completed. Um, fine. And I actually, <laughs> <started> uh, <laughs> well, I it did, but I'm, uh, I'm actually going to finish it now. I, I, I spoke to someone the other day who was going to help me finish it. You know, one of the things that I realized is that in any business, being an entrepreneur, we, we find reasons to bitch and complain about things that aren't going well. And not, not even just being an entrepreneur, I think just 
human beings in life, um, we have we have we find reasons to complain why things aren't going our way. And what I realized through my coaching and through all of the years of being in business is that if we stopped bitching and we started doing something, that we would get get great results. Um, I have I had a mentor that I used to work with, a gentleman by the name of Brian Tracy. And one of the things I learned from Brian is that if I improved one tenth of one percent every day in anything that I did, you know, my business would grow by sixty percent or more. My income would grow by sixty percent or more. My relationships would be enhanced and improved by sixty percent or more. So when we look at what needs to be done on a daily basis to improve, it's very, very small and minuscule. But what we have to do as individuals is we have to stop complaining, stop bitching, and start doing things. So what I also realized is that people, when they sit down and they read a book, you know, and it's three, four, 500 pages, it first of all takes time. And secondly, it's like, well, yeah, I've, I've gone through that, but now what are the actionable items am I going to take on this? What we decided to do and what I decided to do with the Stop Bitching series is no more than 20 pages. Because here's the thing, if I can read 20 pages and then go take action right away, guess what I've just done? I've, I've stopped. I've stopped the madness and the craziness, and now I'm taking action on something that I can improve. That means whether it's health, diet, exercise, uh, relationships, uh, mindset, prospecting, anything in life. Anything in life equates to this because we all do it, right? I still do it. You know, I still bitch about things and then I don't take action on it. But if I stop that and could and, and create that mental click that says, Oop, I'm stopping, I'm done. I'm going to take action on this. I'm going to go do X, Y, and Z. The results you're going to get are going to be amazing. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than what you had before you even started, which was zero. Mm. So, so um, I'm actually in the process of re- revitalizing that and revamping that uh, to come out with at least a series of probably close to 30 small little books and manuals that people can read, you know, in the course of uh, a 20 minute you know, morning ritual or routine they do, and they can take action on something every single day of their life to improve their lives and have a better, better life professionally, but also most importantly, personally as well. I so look forward to seeing that series, uh, Michael, you have no idea. Now, how, how much of this, because because it sounds a lot to me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in stoicism. I, I love stoicism. Um, just, you know, the idea of you cannot control what happens to you, but you can always control your reaction. It, it, it sounds similar. Do you, uh, are, are you into stoicism by any chance? Is that something you've been exposed to at, at some point in your career by any chance? Yeah. So I, um, I meditate, um, when I'm, when I'm really in a good routine, again, I'm not perfect. Yeah. So I, I'm going to be honest with everyone here because If I said I do it religiously every day, that would be a lie. Well, when I do meditate, I typically meditate twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. And it's really no more than 20 minutes. And it could be on anything from, like I did one this morning on on health, a health-related item that I wanted to work on that will make my body feel better physically. Um, But what I've found is that we can control only what we can control, you know? in, in the sense of like today's today, tomorrow's tomorrow, yesterday was yesterday, but the moment you're in now is is in the present. And I think when we live in that present moment and we do the things that are necessary to make us feel good, um, then then life is really life is really good and it's happy. And so I think you know Eastern philosophy for me, um, and not to get religious here, but Eastern philosophy, Buddhism for me. Is, is, is a way of, of just, number one, uh, living life in a really good way, being kind, being gentle, uh, treating my body well, treating other people well, um, learning how to control emotions and all of those things. I think when I do that, um, and I do it regularly, life is really, really good. Now, I will say that prior to probably the last five years, um, I didn't do it that well. And, and yet, as I've worked on it daily and become better at it. Um, I've also incorporated it into how I approach business. Before I used to take things really personal, really personal. 
And now it's like, okay, well, it was a decision. It's a business decision. The company decides, you know, you're not a good fit for the company anymore, or, you know, the client doesn't want to work with you, or all these things happen. It's just, it's just, it just is. And so I think it's how we also react to things that cause us to want to be, um, you know, maybe less reactionary, if you would. Uh, at least I've learned how to do that. Yeah. And I think part of, part of it for me has been through just learning, um, meditating, uh, finding peace in, inside of me that, that makes it a much better place for me to, to operate from. I love it, Michael, and, and and I could talk about this for hours, but we'll we'll, we'll go to other topics here because you know it's sure. it's so interesting. But I will definitely find myself repeating, you know, stop itching <laughs> whenever something happens. Just stop itching, start doing. I love yeah. that. And um, mm-hmm. as you said, it, it comes down to not taking things personally. It comes down to understanding that there's things you can and there's things you cannot control. You cannot control what happens to you, but you can always control your reaction to a certain okay. degree. And as long as you go with that mindset into whatever it is right. that you're doing at that time, you know, yeah. then then you know there's going to be challenges no matter what you do, and oh. uh, it's just about what? embracing them and doing the best that you can. It, exactly. You know, my my father, who's no longer with me, um, he was a real estate developer, and and but yet I learned so much from him. But there were two things, two things that. Um, I think about every day in my life. And number one is he said, every day when you get up, give 100%. Always give 100%, no matter what you're doing, whether you're selling real estate, collecting garbage, uh, doing whatever, you know, your profession or craft is, always give 100%. And then he also said, take 100% of everything that happens to you is personally responsible, that you own that. It's 100% yours, that you cannot blame other people because- because if you do that, then you own it. And so when you're personally 100% responsible for everything that happens to you, you may not like it, but the reality of it at the end of the day is then you own it and you can control it. So, I mean, it's empowering. It's empowering because now you can, do, you can do something about it. If you take responsibility and you put it on someone else, then you're, 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 you're screwed. What can you do? But if, if you accept that there's something you can do about it, even though it won't change what happened, you can focus on action, then, yep. you know, it's empowering because, because there's something you can do. So I, I love that. And, and what, what an interesting, you know, piece of uh, wisdom that you just shared with us. So thank you for that. Now, just moving forward here. So you, 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 you know, basically went on to uh, the hospitality luxury vertical. So I want to talk about luxury, you know, travel just for a second. And, and I guess the first thing that I want to, you know, mention here is there's pros and cons in, in going towards uh, luxury in the sense of, let's say you're a property management company operator, you know, of course, if you're charging a commission, the money is going to be a lot better, you know, in, in the luxury segment. However, sometimes the owner expectations are not going to be the same, or maybe, you know, the owner is going to be even more... Uh, protective of their asset, right? Uh, or maybe they're going to be more skeptical about some some things you might be, uh, you know, recommending such as uh, dynamic pricing. Because in some ultra luxury cases, like you know, we we work in in Los Cabos, we work in Turks and Caicos, we work in some of those markets where we've had situations where the owner doesn't need the reservation, they don't need the money, like one, one booking more one booking less, even though it's a couple thousand bucks, it won't change their lives. So what are some of those, I would say, best practices, but also mistakes that you found people make when trying to get into the luxury segment? And what what have you learned that does work uh, from your experience when trying to be successful, you know, within luxury? Yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, I think it starts with a couple things. First, first where it starts is, um, as a property manager, you have to be thinking about the location you're currently in. And so that leisure destination, whether it's beach, mountain, city, whatever it is, um, does that market first and foremost allow for you to have a piece of your business that is, you know, luxury or ultra luxury? Because I think there's two differences there. There's the mainstream luxury, which is 
know, I've got a home and it rents out for five or six hundred dollars a night. Then there's the ultra luxury when you cross that thousand dollar a night threshold. So I think it first and foremost starts with is the destination you're currently in does does is there is there inventory number one uh, number two is there demand for um, people who are going to book those homes in that location because if there's no demand it doesn't really matter and then I think you have to also look at your business model I mean you know I talk to a lot of property managers globally and one of the things I hear is like oh you know we want to get into the luxury segment okay why. Well, because it's it looks cool, it sounds cool, properties are really nice, there's more ADR, the ABV is higher, all these things. And yet they they don't really have the mechanisms and the tools and the connections and the relationships. And most importantly, maybe the inventory is just not there in their destination for that. And so I think you have to evaluate your business first and foremost. Because if you're managing, as an example, let's say you're a I don't want to use the word commodity type property manager, but let's say you're managing single family homes, condos, townhomes in a beach location. It could be anywhere. Um, and, you know, you have that mix and you have a couple hundred properties. Yes. Could you, could you, you know, develop a luxury segment of your business? The answer is yes. But I go back to what I just said. How is it, is it number one going to cannibalize any other part of your business? You know, um, and then why are you doing it? You know, I, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but I'm just always asking the question, why do you want to be in that, that sector? Now, if you're looking at developing a company just built around luxury, that's a different story, but all those other questions still have to be answered. And I think you brought up a really good point. You know, one of the things is I used to live in Charleston, South Carolina and in, near Charleston, as you know, there's Kiowa Island and Kiowa Island, there's a part of the island called Vanderhorst Plantation. All, most of the homes in Vanderhorst Plantation are oceanfront or golf course. And yeah, we're talking PGA golf course. You know, these are people whose homes will generate two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year in rental revenue. The reality of it, though, is they don't need that money. And like you said, that one booking for an extra 30 grand, nah, we don't need that. So we're not interested in it. So I think once you develop that business plan, you also have to make sure that you have owners that are going to rent their homes out that have a need. Sometimes it's not necessarily financial, although these people are more than likely very well to do. So what what's their what's their reasoning for wanting to rent their home out? And I think part of that is understanding that um, luxury today. It was interesting. I was just recently at Skift last week in New York, and I heard someone talking. Um, the uh, CEO for Raffles, uh, F. McCor, and, and, and um, well, the uh, Orient Express, Will Mayor, great guy. And, and he talked about luxury, defining what luxury is. You have to remember this, and this is really important. Luxury for me, in my definition, might be a villa in Tuscany for $3,000 a night. Luxury for someone else might be a $300 a night condo in Panama City Beach, Florida, because that's what I can afford. That's what my budget allows me for. Yet my definition of luxury for that is not bad, good, or indifferent. It is what it is. Well, I think we get caught up in that word quite a bit. And he talked about defining that because I think we all have to define luxury. It's, it's always being thrown up, luxury, 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 luxury. Luxury is what your market will bear. You know, some markets don't have, you know, $5,000 a night villas and chalets to rent. They have $300 a night and that might be luxury in that market. So it's, it's, a, it's a topic for a, long, a longer discussion, but I think if someone's getting into this business, they really need to think about why do they want to be in that segment? Is it more money? Sometimes. Is it more challenging? Sometimes. Are the owners more difficult? Sometimes the, the business part is easy. It's also the dynamics of what guests expect and homeowners expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the expectations are are completely different. I I, I like the transparency of, of how you shared the, the the challenges that can come with with luxury as a segment. I I, I think uh, defining luxury is a, is a great starting point. 
And I like the way you put it, you know, let's say a thousand dollars in ADR or more. I think it's a, it's a safe way of, of defining luxury. Just curious though, when you look at, because you've been exposed to the, to the global industry of, of luxury, right? Uh, are there any up and coming markets uh, when it comes to luxury that you're particularly, you know, keeping an eye on? Uh, just talking, uh, you know, high level trends. You, I've seen you share a lot of, uh, you know, articles about Chinese travelers and you know what what's happening on that end of things. So yeah, curious to hear your thoughts at, at a macro level where, where luxury as a segment is is going and and what are some of those uh, opportunities we should be keeping an eye. Uh, out for? You know, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think when you look at luxury markets today, you can always, you all can always point to markets like London, Paris, New York, Los Angeles, um, Miami as being great luxury markets because they are, you know, there's inventory in those markets. They're well-traveled. People want to be there. Um, and there are companies there that are, who are operating in those markets that have that type of product and inventory. Um, but then you can look at other markets too. You know, if you look at any leisure destination today, markets like Aspen, the Hamptons, um, you know, Northern California, you know, Napa Valley, those are all luxury markets and, and, and really good markets for people to operate and be in. I think what, the area that I see a lot of growth happening in and will continue to see growth happening in is the Middle East. I think Dubai is, is, really fascinating to me. Um, I think it's, it's, it's booming. It's going to continue to get better. Um, not just the Emirates, but I think Saudi Arabia is a, is a market that over time is going to evolve and people are going to want to trap more travel to. I know, you know, Saudi tourism is really putting a big push on that. And there's, there's just a lot of money there at the end of the day, they're going to build villas and product and services, um, and not just not just you know developers, but hotel companies like you know Accor is doing some things with the Raffles brand and private residences. Um, Four Seasons has that going on in those types of locations. And then I think the other market is Asia. You know Chinese travelers are starting to come back, um, but it's interesting. You know one of the things I read recently is that you know most of the Chinese travelers are not looking for lots of expedition. In, in you know organized tours and things like that they're looking for something a lot more leisure a lot more relaxed you know they want to stay in villas they want privacy and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in Asia you know whether it be Thailand and Bali and Indonesia and all of those places um, China per se I, I don't know that there's a luxury market per se in China although no, no. probably there is uh, but I think Chinese travelers though, are going to continue to look to explore all of those destinations. And then you always will have, as you know, you know, we've, we've spread jet shared time in Mexico and, you know, the Caribbean and in Central and South America. And I think those are right markets too, but very selective lo locations. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and tell me something in terms of homeowner acquisition, going back to wh what we discussed earlier is one of the areas where people should be spending most of their time in, um, assuming they're good at that and they enjoy it, for, of course. Um, you know, what's different about homeowner acquisition on the luxury segment? Is, is there, are there any particularities? We, we, we just talked about owner expectations, but what about the actual acquisition of those homeowners? What, what channels have you seen work best? Yeah, so a lot of it's relationship driven. Um, in the markets that I've worked in, primarily New York and Los Angeles and the Caribbean, most of the homeowners, well, let me step back. Most of the homeowners that we've engaged and began to work with or have worked with, um, this is probably their third or fourth home. Most of them own homes in anywhere from somewhere in Southeast Asia to Los Angeles, New York, London. So, you know, this is probably their second, third, or even fourth home. Um, but, you know, those, are those aren't just traditional people that are going to pick up the phone and call you you know, and say, hey, come rent my house out. So a lot of the development work around that and finding those types of homeowners has been through local real estate firms that specialize in luxury real estate mm -hmm. um, because they are working with that clientele already. And then, you know, we work with, I've worked with a lot of private family offices, individuals who are managing, you know, people's estates and, you know, their, their family wealth, um, wealth, you know, comp management type companies. Because again, these are individuals more than likely 
you know, they don't need to rent their home out, but since they're not living in it, you know, um, and it's vacant six to nine months of the year, might as well. <laughs> why, why not generate a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in income? And, and I think when they can see that, know that their home is going to be exceptionally well taken care of, um, that the guests are vetted and all of those types of things, it makes it easier. But yeah, you're not going to find those typical homeowners just on, you know, some, you know, mailing list or anything like that. It's, it's usually through some, some more specific type of partnerships. Um, a lot of it also can be driven through partnerships with companies like, you know, American Express, Citibank, Capital One, those types of companies that are working with those high net worth individuals that, you know, if you as a company have those types of relationships, uh, it makes it a lot easier. Absolutely. Now I'm curious because because you mentioned you know talking with uh, brokers, brokerages, and and establishing partnerships on on that front. Uh, you've uh, hired you know I, I'm just reading here t- on 112 realtors over a 16 month period uh, back when you were team leader and then you know business coach at Keller Williams. So just curious you know having those two uh, perspectives. Uh, being, you know, with a brokerage firm and being on the, you know, provider side of things as a property manager and whatnot, uh, you know, what are some of the best practices when it comes to building, let's say that referral program with brokers that's actually going to move the needle in terms of your, you know, homeowner acquisition efforts? Um, what, what are some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to establishing a successful referral pro- uh, program with brokers uh, as a property management company, let's say? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I, I think, you know, so with, with my real estate background, it made my world really easy in the companies I worked with because I was really super connected, uh, not just to the, to the world of Keller Williams, but to the likes of firms like Engel and Volkers and Sotheby's and other companies um, nationally and globally. But it, that, that, that doesn't really matter. I think wherever you are in the location you're in, there are firms that are specifically dealing and that are working with, you know, um, property owners, whether they be someone who owns a condo or someone who owns a, a luxury home. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I think the one thing we realized early on and I realized early on is that when you are in the vacation rental property management business and you're in your local destination, the real estate community really doesn't understand our industry. Even though a lot of realtors today think they can manage vacation rental homes and know what they're doing, they really, and this isn't a criticism, they're really good at selling homes, they should stick to that. You know, as far as focusing on vacation rentals, let a professional company do that. So one of the things we realized was if we could create a realtor referral program built around being the realtor a referral fee, whether it's a flat fee or a percentage of the ongoing rental revenue, but more importantly, that we were going to take exceptional care of their client, that we, number one, weren't going to ever compete and sell against them. So we weren't selling real estate. We were solely focused on building a vacation rental management company to to book their home for guest stays. We became a partner. And I think that's the one thing, and that's the key thing that many of these firms need to be thinking about in terms of if I'm in my local community, who are the real estate firms and who are the realtors in the community who are selling inventory or selling product? And in, how do I develop and build that relationship with them? And a lot of times it's not so much about the commission you're going to pay them, although that is nice um, for the home they refer you and that owner puts their home in the program and it generates revenue and so on and so forth. But it's more about the fact that when that homeowner decides to sell, that that home gets referred back to the realtor to say, hey, hey, you know, Sebastian, this, you know, Bob and Sally Smith are decided, they decided to sell their villa. You need to call them so you can get it listed and sold. Because, you know, you as a property manager are going to have a much tighter connection with that homeowner than the realtor. Once the realtor sells the home, if they're good, they'll stay in touch with the owner. But you as a vacation rental manager are going to be talking to that home or, um, homeowner almost every single month. So you're going to develop a much closer bond and relationship with them. So it's really important that you develop those local realtor community relationships. And and I think you have to have multiple. I mean, I would be approaching, if it were me and I owned a, a vacation rental management company, I'd approach every single real estate firm in the market I'm in to ask them what they're doing with short-term rentals, 
you know, are they managing those homes? Maybe they're managing those homes and they're they're not, they're just they're struggling with it. They don't want to do it anymore. Well, there might be a nice portfolio of homes that you could take on and manage and pay them a nice referral fee on. So you just don't know. And I think, but realtors for me personally have been one of the best resources for 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 finding homeowners that need you know need your help. That's huge. Now we cannot you know wrap up this episode without talking at least a little bit more about real estate. So I'm curious to know um, you. Uh, do you invest in real estate? Do you do you invest in in short term rental properties? Um, and if so, which markets? What's been your investment journey? I know you mentioned your dad was a developer. Do you also develop? Yeah. Like, tell us a little bit more about your real estate investment background. Yeah, so um, I, I grew up in a family that that was uh, like I said, my dad was a big developer, and and also he, he believed in buying and investing in real estate because it's still. In, and in my opinion, to this day, the greatest asset you can, you know, whether it's it's better than the stock market and crypto and anything else. That's just my opinion, but everyone can take that for whatever it's worth. Um, uh, I did at one time. Um, I used to own, you know, quite a few rentals. They were not short-term rentals; they were annual rentals, and um, sold a lot of that inventory off at a period of my life where I needed to, and it's going through some life changes and things like that. So I, I liquidated my portfolio. Um, and um, actually, am in the process. Of, I don't invest at the moment. Um, you know, life kind of takes different paths and you know different things. I've made investments in my children in their education, uh, and versus uh, doing other things. But um, you know, buying and investing in in short term rentals, in my opinion, is one of the best things you can do. Um, I'm you know I'm going to look at doing more of that uh, because I believe in it. You know, in any real estate for that matter, it doesn't have to be a short term rental. It could be commercial real estate. Um, I'm actually still involved with Keller Williams. Um, I'm uh, an investor in six offices. Um, so I am still actively involved in the real estate world, um, but not just, I mean, I'm doing it in a little bit of a different way where now I'm invested in real estate firms. I'm not so much in the inventory and the, and the specific product, but I need to go back to buying um, short-term rentals because it's you know when you're in this industry, you see great opportunities, and I think there are some really great markets to be investing in. Um, you know that you can get some really great deals on, and you can make a lot of a lot of really good um, you know passive income. And you know I, passive income to me is a, is a, it's something that you know is very important. It's it's never really passive unless you really put a property manager in place, which. You know, if you if you buy abroad, that's one of the good things about buying abroad is you force yourself to put a management, you know, team in place. That way, you you you're not going to be tempted to go and fix. Going back to what we were saying earlier about what's your hourly rate, you know, it's very tempting when you invest in your backyard to to go and do you know certain things yourself versus you know making sure that it's uh, it's something that run itself runs itself as much as possible from the get-go now what what just curious when when you said that you're still investing in real estate but not in the actual asset of real estate but in the real estate companies what do you what do you mean by that is it uh like you're a private uh, you're a passive investor in in some in some deals or or is it like you what what, what does that mean exactly uh, passive investor in some deals but mostly mostly it's an investor in the firm meaning um, i own a percentage of the firm so if the firm has you know the firm itself so if the firm has you know 50 100 agents um, it's it's being invested that way, and and when it comes to you know investing in real estate, let's say we, we when we look at multifamily versus you know short term rentals, uh, I always like to touch on you know the fact that on one end you have more uh, you know appreciation, let's say in the sense that you can actually force the appreciation when it comes to multifamily, it tends to be easier to have the bank recognize the revenues. Uh, of of whatever property you have, if you've if you've done some renovations or whatnot, on the on the short term rental side of things, we have a lot of liquidity, but it's a little bit harder to leverage your growth with that liquidity. You cannot really you know use that to buy your next uh, deal, uh, at least not yet. But a lot of players are coming in with the hypothesis that. You know, we're going to build a portfolio of short-term rental properties, 
And in a few years, there's going to be institutional investors that are going to come in and there's going to be appetite for short-term rental portfolios. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, great, great question and comment. I, I think multifamily for sure is, is it's not that short term is a, is, a, is a bad way to go. I think you could definitely do it. But like you said, you know, if I buy, a, let's say, a property and it's got 20, 20 units in, it, in multifamily and I raise the rents by $200 a month in each property, you know, first of all, my cash flow is way better. The bank recognizes now the asset is that much more valuable. So if I need to borrow against it, I'm going to have a much easier time to leverage that, to be able to take that, excuse me, and then reinvest it back into my business. You're right about short-term rentals. There's great deals out there, but the reality of it at the end of the day is, you know, you're going to get that appreciation, but it's not going to be like you would see maybe in a multifamily type type scenario. Now, most people, you know, and I don't know if everyone, you know, personal financial worlds, but most people do not have the capital to invest in in those types of multifamily deals. However, with this being said, um, there is money out there, and there are people who want you know are looking for investors. And so, you know, you might have to start small. You buy a duplex and start start that way, and then a four family, and then an eight family, and then. But my point in all of it is, is it's still a great way to and an opportunity to invest. Now, I will say this: I think the one thing I'm seeing. And I talk to a lot of VC, venture capital and private equity, uh, probably weekly. And um, one thing I am seeing is that many of them are always looking for what's the next best angle and how do we get involved in the short term market, whether they are buying companies and keeping those companies as their same brand or they're looking at technology solutions or, you know, vendors within the space. I think more and more people are looking at it. Um, are they are they pulling the trigger? Not as quick as I thought some would, but I but but there are investors and institutional investors now that I think we're going to see more and more getting involved in the short term space. However, I don't know that it's going to be an individual home. I'm going to buy an individual home at Aspen and then one in Whistler. It's going to be I'm going to buy a building. Mm-hmm. It's got eight units. You know, we're going to furnish them. We're going to treat it like either a apartment hotel like a Sonder or whatever you want to call it and then manage it that way you know and I think that's that's an area where there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for those invest in institutional investors yeah no definitely well listen Michael I could I could have you here for hours because the conversation has been that interesting and that insightful if if we can wrap up with one piece of advice that you would give to someone out there, you know, going back to that mentality of something that you can do today, what is what is one thing that our audience can do today when it comes to, you know, being more successful in the space, either as a property manager or as a real estate investor um, that is going to make a big impact on their business and that they can implement as soon as they finish watching this episode? I would say just be decisive, make a decision. and And what I mean by that is, even if you decide and it's wrong and it and it fails or you stumble and you you know you don't have the success you want, you at least made a decision. Don't hesitate. Decide now. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. But make a decision. You know whether it's to invest in something, to start a business, to call five extra homeowners. I mean, whatever that is, just decide and take action. Because if you're not doing that, you know you're stagnant. And I think. Even when you make a decision, and and I've made a lot, and I have failed a lot, and I think that's you know we again we could spend hours on why failure is good in my opinion, but I think even if you fail or stumble and it doesn't come out the way you want, you'll have learned something, and you'll be better off for it. Absolutely, thank you so much, Michael, for being here. I look forward to having Great you to on the here. show again, hopefully in a few months. And um, we'll see each other at uh, most likely VRMA in Orlando, I guess. I'll see you in a, yeah, I'll see you in a few weeks. All right, Michael. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Take care.